So I decided to give this a name. I called it Through the Mook Darkly. Why did it call? Why did I call it that? Just because uh, that's the phrase that entered my mind when I asked myself, what should I call this? Uh, I looked up the Bergman film, uh, and, and I looked up the source of the phrase and all of that, and that kind of gave me a theme to structure everything else around. So I was asked to say who I am or to outline who I am, and of course you got the official introduction uh, from Jackie at the start, uh, but here's the, the less official version of who I am. I, I'm a researcher for Canada's National Research Council, but really what I do is a mix of four major things uh, for, uh, oh come on, You try to just switch it back to the camera, and it doesn't just switch back to the camera. You have to mess with it a bit, and then it switches back to the camera. Okay, so I'm in a mix of four things, uh, and as you saw on the slide there that I couldn't get rid of, a mix of the philosopher, the journalist, the technologist, and the educator. The, my philosophy background is my formal academic background and what that means is when I come to research in education and educational technology I'm coming from a perspective as a philosophical researcher my readings are different probably from what you read uh, educators grew up in Bloom and 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 Dewey and Witkowski and, and the rest of them uh, I, I read you know Hume and Ayer and Bertrand Russell and uh, Wittgenstein, and you know, I've looked at questions of knowledge and learning from the perspective of ontology, epistemology, metaphysics, philosophy of mind. So I'm coming at it from a different perspective. The journalist in me began somewhere before grade five. Uh, I created a, uh, a little newspaper on a mimeograph machine in our school called the Eagle Report. Uh, when I was at university, I was editor of the student newspaper for a couple of terms, and today even uh, I have my newsletter, OL Daily. The technologist you've seen to some degree uh, in my writing and thinking about technology topics, but you know I also program computers. Uh, the my website, which is downs.ca, runs on software that I created myself. And I've been doing this for many years. I actually worked with Texas Instruments for a little while. And technology has always been a theme uh, in the work that I've done. And then, of course, the educator. Uh, I have experience in the classroom. Uh, I have the harsh experience as, as a graduate assistant teaching his first class to 88 eager first-year students. Uh, and that was my introduction to teaching. No preparation, no nothing. They just threw me in front of that classroom and said, teach them logic. Uh, and so I did. But, you know, I spent seven years as a tutor with Athabasca University, and I've worked in a number of educational institutions through the years. And so I have a pretty good practical background. And, of course, recently with people like George Siemens and others, I've been teaching online. So that's who I am. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And, you know, I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about, you know, this this set of things that I've learned, this, this you know, these four domains, these four disciplines, uh, and maybe a few others besides. They, they don't characterize what I know particularly. You know, it's not a whole list, a whole stack of uh, of contents in my brain they really do represent what I've come to be over time, uh, the kind of person I've become, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the thing, if you will, that I've become. And so that's what sort of sets off this talk today. And I'm thinking about it, and again, you know, 
first thing that sprung into my mind when I thought, what should my title be, it was Through a Mook Darkly. I had no idea why. I honestly don't know. Everything came from that title, which came from nothing. So I looked it up, and as I looked it up, it occurred to me that learning itself has a lot in common with growing up. You know, and it's funny, when we think of the transition from childhood to adulthood, it has a lot to do with what we learn. You know, and adults, we know how to drive. As children, we don't. Adults, we can handle our alcohol. As children, we can't. Uh, but, you know, it's, you know, and you've all gone through this experience. You, you remember your childhood, and you remember becoming an adult, and it wasn't accumulating more and more stuff in your mind, it was becoming a different person, literally a different person. Yeah, I am the same guy I was when I was a kid, you know, with all those strange dreams and ideas and, and, and thoughts and prospects and that. But I'm also a very different person than I was as well. Uh, and it's this difference that is the outcome uh, or, 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 you know, the, the, the consequence of learning. So, we think about that, I think about that, and now I move to the first question, and the first question was uh, the question of the future of higher education. Oh, dang, I forgot one of my effects. Okay, well, I'm going to give you the effect quickly because I planned it. There's way too much to remember when I'm trying to do this. Okay, here's the... Oh, dang, I keep hitting the wrong button. All right, so now we can see. This is me saying who I am. That's, a, that's another Stephen Downs who isn't me. Pretty neat effect, eh? Okay, uh, and then now this is the through the glass darkly childhood is like learning effect. And, and the idea here, again, is to show how moving from childhood to adulthood isn't just accumulating a whole bunch of new knowledge. It's becoming a different person. It, it's creating a new perspective, new point of view, etc. Okay, that's a pretty cool effect. All right, let's move to the next point then, which is to look at the future of higher education, which is the first of the questions, at long last, uh, that I was asked to, to address. And in understanding the future of higher, edu higher education, I think we, we need to understand, actually it says future of education and higher education, but in either case, we need to understand what they call the value proposition. This is one of those terms from business and economics, and I don't have much time for business and economics, but some of the concepts are, are useful, and this is one of them. The, the idea of a value proposition is what it is you're actually selling. Uh, for example, uh, people might think that they're selling a certain product, but they're actually selling the experience that goes with the product. People think that they're selling books, but what they're actually selling is not the printed word, but the storytelling that is contained within the books. Uh, so what is it that uh, people are actually selling? And again, I hate the word selling here, but I'll use it because it's a business economics thing. When you're, when you're selling education or higher education, or to flip it around a bit, what is it that we're actually doing uh, when we're doing education. Well, I think there's two sides to it. And the one side is the, 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 the side that we're familiar with, the learning, the content, the job training aspect of it, the idea of uh, there being content that we're trying to get from the teacher or professor's head to the student's head. I really think that's a very small part of it. The other side of it is socialization, network, and identity. And it's interesting with, with all of this discussion of MOOCs and online learning and that, that those colleges and universities who are most about that 
are, are the ones that have been on MOOCs and online content generally. Think, for example, about what you're buying when you buy an education from Yale, right? Uh, yes, you're buying philosophy courses, perhaps, or architecture courses, or whatever. But really, what you're buying is this whole community at, at Yale. Uh, you're, you're buying, you know, the alumni association. You're buying the, the networking that you're doing with people. You're buying possible membership in the. Uh, the Yale Skull and Bones Society, uh, with the possibility of of becoming, you know, a president or a leader of industry or some such thing. Uh, I remember reading F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, The Side of Paradise, and and he talks about you know going through his prep school, which was his only formal education, took a couple of years, and then going to university at Princeton. And you know, I was very jealous. You can get into Princeton after a couple of years of school, but that's the way it was back then. But more, more to the point, you know, what happens when he goes to Princeton isn't the learning so much as he's setting up his network of connections, his social relations, and all of that for the rest of his life. And so, this is that value proposition that I'm talking about. This, this idea of developing the socialization, developing the networking, developing the identity. Now, we think of education as these two things separate. Learning content and job training is one thing, and socialization, networking, identity is another. And as long as we keep them separate, like this, then we can have one education system for the masses, which is the learning and content and all of that, and another education system for the future Skull and Bones members. But more and more, as I think about learning, and I think more and more as researchers in general think about learning, we come to understand that these two aspects of the value proposition are one and the same. That learning to be say, a geographer, uh, a car repair person, uh, a police officer, uh, a physicist, an engineer, isn't just learning the content, isn't just learning the principles, isn't just getting on the job training, but is actually a process where you become one of these things. You become a geographer. You become an engineer. Engineers really understand this. Uh, engineering is a very academically rigorous process, uh, but at the end of the engineering degree, they go through something called the Iron Ring Ceremony. Uh, and the Iron Ring is uh, traditionally fabricated out of the iron of a bridge that collapsed. And the idea is that you wear the iron ring to remember your responsibility uh, as an engineer to society. But it's also this process of socialization, right? This process of, of identification. You are an engineer. You haven't simply learned to be an engineer. You are an engineer. Why is this important? I think the future of higher education lies in understanding this and, and we're at one of those crossroads where we could say oh yeah learning is just about getting the content and the knowledge and we'll go off in that direction and get it terribly terribly wrong or we could understand that in learning in education we're about creating or I don't even, I was going to say we're about creating people, but it's not that kind of education. Uh, we're, we're about helping people define who they want to be and then become that person. And I think that, that's a much more hands-on, uh, a much more, I'm looking for the right word here, authentic isn't the right word, but much, much, much more humanistic model of learning. So, that's the frame, that's the backdrop. So, moving from that, now we move into the question that's on everybody's minds today. And 
that's the question of MOOCs. Now, we, we know kind of what a MOOC is, Massive Open Online Course, so it's open, it's online, it's massive, or supposed to be massive, and of it's a course. Now, the thing with, with MOOCs is it isn't simply about replacing one kind of a course with another kind of a course. And I, I think we need to understand this, although it, it has been presented that way recently. Uh, I'm sure you all read um, from uh, Phil Hill and others about the uh, San Jose State University deciding to get out of, uh, or to put on pause more accurately its agreement with uh, Udacity. And, and the reason for that, and as we go through uh, Phil Hill's article, we, re we, we read that the uh, students who were taking the MOOC were not passing the class, uh, or at least not at the same rate as the uh, students who were taking the more traditional class. Now, I think about this, and what seems to me significant here, and, and, and Phil makes the point, you know, it's a very hastily done, last minute, poorly planned kind of exercise and we should not be surprised that it didn't succeed. But it's also one of these exercises where we just took this MOOC, pulled it out of the air, if you will, and said, oh, take this instead of that, and expected it to work. And that seems to me to be unrealistic. You know, let, let's come back to the whole question of the course model in general, and you know, think about the problems of the course model in general. The idea here with the course model is that you can take this narrowly defined segment of learning and simply slot it in, you know, sort of like plug and play learning. And that's the model we've developed over the years. Now, in regular, you know, K-12 education and college and university education, we know that we can't just do that. And we know that what we really need to do is give students a series of courses, which we call a program or a course of studies or some such thing, you know, leading to some ultimate objective or degree. In other words, courses don't generally just stand on their own, you know, unless you're taking something from human resources at a company, but normally they're part of a larger process. They're also spelt with an R. Uh, and we don't have that structure, background, or infrastructure yet for MOOCs. You know, one, one, one of the common criticisms of a MOOC is that, you know, students need to really be prepared. You know, they need to be academically ready. They need to have motivation, be able to, you know, study for themselves in order to be successful in a MOOC. And I say, well, yeah, that's true. But it's also true of traditional courses that students need to have a whole set of skills. You know, they need to sit quietly, with their hands folded in front of them, et cetera. But you know, uh, they need to learn to listen, they need to do group work, they need to be able to read uh, at, at a fairly high level in order to be successful in traditional courses. But we have this whole infrastructure that helps people be prepared to take traditional courses. So by the time they get to you know Geography 101 at Yale, they've mastered most of what they need to master in order to be successful at that course. And they can actually focus not so much on the course, but on all the social goings on around them, because that's what they're really interested in when they're at Yale. They're so good at taking courses by then, they can do that at 20% effort. The MOOCs take more effort, and they take more effort because People don't know how to study this way yet. They will. You know, people who've grown up using the internet will know how to study this way. But right now, what we have is what I would call the MOOC out of water phenomenon. And I tried to find a video of fish flopping on the ground, but I don't have one. Uh, but the MOOC out of water phenomenon, this is fish flapping on the ground. Uh, you know, you just imagine these students who've been plucked out of a traditional system and tossed into a MOOC. And it's like somebody who can't read being tossed into a reading course. Well, they're not going to be successful because we don't have the background right. We don't have the environment right. So what is that environment? 
and that leads to the next one of the questions that I was asked to talk about. And that question just concerns open ed generally. I was asked for an open education overview. Well, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's no single model for open education. Uh, and, and so you can't really give the open ed overview. Uh, there's instead different ways of looking at openness, different concepts of openness. Uh, traditional openness, you know, open education is what we saw at the open university, for example, uh, where, you know, it still costs you money and you still have to go there, but there are no admission standards. So that's, that's the very traditional sort of open education. Uh, on the other hand, we have the concept of what I would call free learning, which is open learning with uh, no costs, and in a sense, open learning with no limits. Free learning to me refers not simply to the price, but also to the idea that the learning is created by and managed by the people who are doing the learning. And we also have open access, and I think this is a fundamental kind of openness where uh, we're accessing not just the content, but the community itself. And this goes back to our value proposition, right? If we're just af if we're just offering people access to the content part of education, we're really offering them access only to half the education, and not even the important half. And in fact, the half that is over time becoming less and less important. Uh, open access, to me, means access not just to the content, to the but also to the community itself. And that's why. When we developed MOOCs, we developed them the way we did, uh, with access to the teaching, access to the interaction uh, of the participants among each other and with the instructors and the guests in the course. There are other forms of open access, and I've talked about them. I won't linger on them here, but I do want to mention them so that we don't forget them, and those are open, as open access in terms of open assessment, and open access in terms of credentials, for example, badges. And these are sorts of ways of getting at open access to the community. Um, we, we think of MOOCs, we, we think of the technology, the technical innovations and all of that, uh, but I want to focus on the last bit that I put here in this title, assessing the person not to memorization. And again, this speaks to this wider aspect of learning, this aspect of learning that's more like becoming than it is like absorbing. Uh, right now, one of the big questions about MOOCs is how do you assess learning? And when people ask that sort of question, it's like they're asking how much of the content that was presented in the course actually remain, remained in the person after the course. And to me, that's a, a very uninteresting question because that's not the purpose of an education. If we think of the purpose of an education as a process of helping a person become something, then our assessment should be something along the lines of, has that person become the sort of person that they wanted to become when they set out in their learning program? Well, how do we ask that? Uh, Traditionally, it was very hard to do, and really the only way you could do it was through a process of recognition. And what by recognition, what I mean is this phenomenon, it, it's cognitively, it's essentially the same as recognizing a face or recognizing a tiger in a forest or recognizing a fish out of water or whatever, but recognizing basically is where one person who is familiar with the domain or the discipline looks at the other person performing tasks and, and, and other things related to that discipline saying, yes, this person is a successful such and such. Uh, sports is a really good example. We all go to the baseball diamond or the football field and we watch the players play. And although we're not experts, uh, 
uh, because otherwise we'd be playing because they get paid millions of dollars. Although we're not experts, we can watch their performance on the field and judge for ourselves whether or not they're good players. You know, you you you, you watch uh, I don't know Alexander Rodriguez play third base and you say, yeah, that guy can play third base. How do you know that? Well, you've seen lots of third basemen and just does it better. There's a whole variety of things. Well, the same thing is true of engineers. You know, you, you can tell that somebody is a good engineer or a bad engineer well before the bridge collapses. And the way you do that is you look at all the all of the things that a person does in the course of their working as an engineer. Right? The documents they do, uh, the reports that they write, the conversations they have with other engineers, and you can tell, especially experienced engineers can tell if a person is a good engineer through a multitude of little, simple little things. Like, do, they use, do they use the words correctly? Do they think the right sorts of things are important? Do they view the world in a certain way? Uh, do they have all of these little points of professionalism? You know, and it's, it's all of these things that you learn at Yale or that you learn at finishing school or prep school uh, before you get entered into the club. And all of these things are actually the criteria for membership in the club. Now, the tests touch none of that. The tests take certain abstractions and they say, this is being an engineer. We'll test them on this, and if they get this, they probably got the rest. Kind of a crapshoot. Uh, in the future, as more and more people work in a MOOC-like environment, and by MOOC-like, I mean my kind of MOOC, not Udacity's kind of MOOC, a MOOC-like environment where you do your work in a public way, and you share that work with a community of people, and it might be organized around a series of events. We call these events courses, but really what they are is shared academic or professional practice that happens over a defined period of time. And as more and more people do that, you can see a greater and greater percentage of their public performance. And we can use software and other analytic tools to actually perform the task of recognizing performance in the same way we can program to recognize the tiger in the woods or the face of a person that security services are looking for. So I think the, the really interesting technology that's going to be coming up isn't the MOOC itself. Uh, it isn't personal learning networks. It certainly isn't learning analytics properly so called, but it's this kind of total understanding of what learning is. And I, I think we're still pretty far away away from that. Just a few thoughts now to finish off. And uh, this, this was the section where they asked me for uh, my favorite topic of the day. And my favorite topic of the day concerns the purpose of education. Because more and more we're being asked to justify learning from the perspective of, uh, you know, employment, jobs, and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and more and more we're seeing the economic motivation for learning, both on the producer side and, and as well as on the consumer side. And this is why we're seeing uh, you know, Clarence Fisher reported this, Coursera getting 43 million, Brightbytes getting 2.5 million, D2L getting 80 million, etc. There have been all kinds of funded projects in education, and these are all based around the idea that there's a connection between learning and the economy. And yes, yes, everybody needs a job, or at the very least, everybody needs an income. They need to eat. They need to have the capacity to have a good life. But learning is not about jobs and the economy. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, learning is not about jobs and the economy. When we're engaged in the process of education, we're not engaged in the process of improving the economy. We're engaged in the process of helping a person become 
the kind of person that they want to be. And not everybody in the world wants to be the kind of person who is dedicated to helping the economy. You know, it's, it's not something you put on your tombstone. Uh, you don't say at the end of your life, uh, Fred, uh, born 1920, died 2020, he helped the economy. Yeah, it's not really what we look for. Secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, economic issues aren't going to be solved by education. And people who tell you that they are, are, are misrepresenting the state of affairs. Now, education, and particularly the broader model of education, the social identity forming kind of aspect of education, is necessary for economic success. Uh, it, it's difficult, almost impossible, to achieve economic success, social success, and the other kinds of success without that. But it's not sufficient. And it's this not sufficient part that I think is really important. Uh, you know, the, the problems with the economy are not being caused by the fact that people aren't educated enough. We have the most educated population in the history of the world. Uh, you know, there are more educated people today, there are, they are more educated uh, than any other time in history, uh, yet we're in, in an economic recession. So clearly the one isn't directly related to the other. I think we're looking much more about fundamental issues of fairness that need to be addressed. I think we need to be looking at things like income distribution. I think we need to be looking at uh, who has their hands on the levers of power, who has their hands on the control of resources and production. You know, Carl Sagan did a book called Cosmos, and the closing chapter of Cosmos was Who Speaks for Earth? And it, it's some of the most poignant writing I've ever seen, certainly by scientists uh, who don't generally write like that or even think like that. And I think it's a relevant question. Uh, you know, and when we look at education, we want to ask, you know, who speaks for the students? Who speaks for the people who are being educated? And we want it to be the students who are deciding for themselves who they are and who they are going to become, who they are going to be. And if we make education subservient to the economy, if we make education subservient to the people who control the bulk of the wealth, what we're doing is we're saying as a society that uh, this small number of people will be able to tell people who they are and what they are. And I don't think that this is a, this is a, you know, a, a sustainable long-term strategy because I think people want more and I think people want their education to become meaningful for themselves. Also, I don't think it's a good model for the economy. Uh, simply because uh, the economy, like any network, thrives through equity of the distribution of resources, through diversity, through autonomy of independent agents, through interactivity, and through openness. And, and part of that openness is openness into the club, openness into the social identity forming aspect of education. So, I'm not sure what you're expecting for a talk from me today, but these are, well, this is what's on my mind today, um, and uh, this is what follows from the, uh, you know, through the MOOC Darkly title that sprung into my head, like Pallas Athena fully formed, uh, and uh, I hope you found it interesting. And over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Down. Um, we probably uh, open the floor up for talking about this at the moment. I, I have a couple that I want to um, ask you as well. I, I don't know uh, your local familiarity. I'm probably wondering how affordable can Sailor make an actual college degree? Uh oh. Sorry. <laughs> I had a sailor advertisement start playing. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Just for the record, you should not have videos that auto start on your web pages. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm having trouble hearing um, what you're saying on the other side. There's a lot of warbling in that, so if people have extra microphones open, that might be causing it. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think we do, but I'll uh, try to uh, get a little closer to the um, mic that we're using. We didn't, we're trying to eliminate some interference. This is actually our first time using uh, uh, Hangout Group. Uh -huh. We really appreciate all of your patience with our myriad of uh, technical obstacles that we can. Uh, but what I was saying was, I'm not sure of your level of familiarity of, uh, with the kind of uh, courses that we've been creating. Uh, they're um, asynchronous courses, uh, self-paced. Um, we do have some available for students to interact with each other kind of based on um, their own choosing and did launch over the summer a uh, summer school session where we had to be synchronized. We would send out animation, encourage um, our uh, facilitators to participate in forums and um, kind of make sure that we were on students more. Um, but where do you see an organization um, like ours that doesn't um, you don't necessarily run a loop type of model uh, or individualized you want to learn a few to um, type of model? Where do you see that in your in your you know, what um, organizations can do that to provide some of that equity and learning and, um, that that you were saying so many <laughs> okay, I, I think I get a sense of the question. It, it's again very difficult to to make out the sound. Um, boy, I sure hope the oh well, yeah, I'm sure the recording will come out better. But um, I mean, this is a this is a question that's being faced by most of distance education, uh, especially recently, because most of distance education has historically been composed of. Uh, course packages and self-paced courses. You know, the, these were the sorts of things I worked with when I worked with Athabasca University, and they they sent out these books, uh, well, books, booklets, uh, workbooks, uh, and videos, and one course even sent out a human brain, well, plastic model of a human brain, um, which is a good thing. <laughs> now that I think about it, um, and. Athabasca at the time really emphasized to its staff the need to contact and 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 connect with the students taking the course and and one of the things that that we did is you know in the first week that they took the course they signed up there's a certain start date we would call them and and tell them that we were there help them with any starting problems and that one act would double our completion rate uh, because you know there's there's this huge difference between taking a course by yourself and taking a course in the context of some social environment, even a nebulous kind of distance social distant social environment. Terry Anderson calls it presence, right, and and he speaks about. Uh, cognitive presence and social presence and, and the, the idea here is that having presence increases the effectiveness of the course. So for an organization like Sailor, and, and you're, you're certainly not alone in this, um, I would be looking at trying to add that element of presence to the learning materials to the self-paced courses, and you know you're not going to be offering MOOCs properly so-called because you know certainly not MOOCs along the model of Coursera or Udacity for a variety of reasons, 
and, and, and mostly because it's simply not practical to do that. But you do have learning resources that can be situated within the social environment, the social learning environment. And, you know, at, at one end, that means something as simple as, uh, you know, attaching social networking uh, communications functionality to your online courses. So even if a person starts a course, they start their self-paced, they start whenever they want, there's a Twitter hashtag. So as soon as they start, they can check the Twitter hashtag and communicate with other people talking in the course. More long term and, and more immersively, if you will, uh, the courses become more and more of these immersive exercises into wider communities. Uh, and that's the sort of MOOC that George Siemens and I created where we weren't so concerned about building this course and offering it online as we were about opening up this process to the community to take part in. And I think, I think you'll find over time as you enable more and more community, and, and, and I, I'm trying to find different words rather than repeat the same word over and over again, but uh, more community, more socialization, more communication, more interaction, uh, as, you, as you enable more of that in the courses, you'll find, I think and I hope, that these courses become less and less something that you create and more and more something that the participants create until the courses will begin to morph over time. And from your perspective, you'll need to create room for that to happen. You'll need to create room for the course to become something new, room for new materials to be added, uh, flexibility and space for people to take what you've created and, as I like to say, fold, spindle, and mutilate it, mutilate it, turn it into something of their own. Uh, you know, eventually the idea here is the stuff that you've created becomes the material that participants in your course, they don't simply learn it, but they use it to communicate with each other and, and to create projects of their own. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, that might answer most of my questions. Does anyone else have any questions? If you do, if you'd like to um, kind of come over and wait, I'll actually do the help here. Any other questions you guys want? Hi, Mr. Downs. This is Jen Shu. Um, my question is, you said earlier that students aren't currently set up for success in the current iteration of online education. Um, future generations might be, maybe because they've grown up in this completely digitized, or more digitized world. Um, what can be done for students today in order to better prepare them for success? Make them do things? <laughs> Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there are two aspects to the question. First of all, what are those conditions for success? And then secondly, how can we foster them? Keeping in mind, we can't just teach them because, you know, I mean, then we're going back to the old model where, you know, the conditions are of success or some sort of content we stuff into their head. That doesn't work either. So. First of all, what are the conditions of success? Uh, I use an analogy, and I think it's a pretty good analogy, where learning a domain like physics or engineering or geography or whatever is like learning a language. It's, it's like becoming literate. And there's an, an awful lot of touch points in that analogy. And if you allow that, if you allow yourself to see yourself as becoming a speaker of physics, uh, of beer of physics, a doer of physics, then underlying principles of literacy are the underlying principles of success in this kind of environment. 
And that makes sense, and that's consistent with the way it was with classes, where actual literacy, being able to read books and, and write papers, were the conditions of success. So what are these underlying conditions of literacy? Well, there's a set of them. Uh, one of them, for example, falls under the general heading of syntax or pattern recognition. And this is basically just a set of skills associated with perception and cognition where when you look at and interact with an environment, you're able to infer regularities or systems from that environment. It's the process by which we recognize tigers in a forest, because tigers are orange and forests are green. Uh, it's the process by which we recognize uh, grammar and, and rules of syntax and language. It's the process where we recognize trends in the history, patterns in the weather, etc. There's a whole range of them. So this is one type of literacy. And where it plays a role in learning in MOOCs is in being able to detect and identify materials, resources, even communities and people in the world who would be relevant to learning this or that subject. And one of the things that we did in our MOOCs is we had people find resources every day or as frequently as they could and contribute them. And the idea, and George said this well, part of learning a subject is learning to find the right stuff related to the subject. So it's, and what we're doing here is we're trying to foster this, you know, regularity generation, this recognition capacity. Now, you, you can't just teach the principles of it, right? Uh, they try to do that in language learning. You learn all the, all the rules of grammar, underline the nouns, circle the verbs, and you know that, becomes, that gets old really quickly. The best way to do it is to learn it is by doing it. Uh, you know, it's, I used to love Sesame Street. Well, I used to love Sesame Street. I never watched Sesame Street because I was too old. It started too late. But one of the things it did brilliantly was this this whole which of these things does not belong segment. And you might think that was a complete waste of time, but it's teaching this pattern recognition kind of thing by having you practice looking at patterns. And so preparing a person for pattern recognition, especially a young person, involves Having them do this, having them find patterns, having them find regularities, giving them games, quizzes, uh, you know, exercises, whatever, that involve the recognition of patterns, the finding of regularities, the, uh, you know, abduction of, of laws of nature. Well, that might be a bit much, but you know what I mean? And, again, you don't teach them this, you just have them do it. Uh, this is the same. There, there's a there's there's a set of these literacies. Uh, you know, determining meaning, value, and truth. For example, learning to use concepts and ideas to do things. For example, uh, understanding place, awareness, context, localization, situation, environment, uh, process of of inference. Uh, induction, deduction, definition, description, uh, and, and understanding processes uh, of change, growth, cycle, uh, spiral, and those sorts of things. All of these are underlying elements of cognition that support success in a MOOC environment. And, and these are the sorts of things you have, you, have, you, just, you have to learn them by practicing them. Right now, we don't. Right now, we don't even come close to, you know, you think about, you know, how much, how much, how much uh, learning by deduction do we instill in our in our children, for example? How much inductive reasoning do we get them practicing? And it's actually very little. So they have to go from being receptors to being actual generators of language, logic, and meaning. And and there's a whole range of ways to do that.
So I think that's how I would approach your question. I hope that wasn't too long. No, that was great. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, I have one. I don't know. I'm going to turn the, the camera here because it's not, the room view is not on YouTube directly. Uh, hi, Stephen. It's Sean. Hi. I've been sort of monitoring the Hangout uh, console here uh, just off the screen. But So I, I read probably just the other day 25% uh, of North American uh, internet traffic or something like that is going to Google servers, right? Um, and I think that you can pay what? I'm sorry? Uh, is going through Google servers. Oh, Google servers, yeah. And I, I know you're a big, uh, you've been a big proponent of ownership of data, of, of RSS. Um, you built your own tools in order to make sure that it works the way you need it to work. Um, and it's sometimes hard to imagine or, uh, or we easily forget that you know, there was a time before the internet, there was a time before the web enabled all this uh, this networking and, and connection. Um, so I guess, you know, my main question here is, is what's your hope or what's your uh, vision, uh, especially on your most optimistic days for how people are going to be connecting 10 years from now, say? Where, where are we going with well, we'll still use the internet, mostly because it's really hard to change a Volkswagen into a truck while you're still driving it. Uh, you know, there's, there's no practical alternative. But, you know, the internet itself is constantly morphing and changing, and, and mostly in the direction of increased bandwidth and increased access. Um, it's interesting the, the, the figure you quoted, 25% of all traffic goes through Google. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like 24% of that is probably cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> uh, and that, that's, you know, I, and one of the things that really gives me hope for the internet is that, you know, I can't imagine people letting go of that. I, I can't imagine us giving up on Catterday. Uh, I can't imagine us giving up on XKCD and and sending selfies and posting what become viral videos and all of that. And you know, from the very beginning of the internet, even before the beginning of the internet, this is what made it great. You know, and there's a whole history of stories. You know. Uh, you know, Larry Lipman, the the I will answer anything person on Usenet, for example, uh, and 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 so on. So there's that human aspect of the internet that makes it great. We're right now having that human aspect collide with the commercial aspect, and that's where we see the Facebooks and the Twitters and and all of that. And I'm sure they would very much like to make it their own private service. And I don't think we should let them. Uh, there, there is this, uh, you know, host your own internet movement. You know, keep your own data. And I think that we are going to have more options in the future than we have now. Um, right now, you know, if we if we want to have a space online, if we want to have a presence, you know, it used to be we'd have to set up a web page. That was hard, and only geeks could do that. And then we'd use Blogger or something like that, and that was somewhat less hard. And a lot of people could do that, but it wasn't very flexible. And so the next generation is the social media services that we have now. And you know, it, it, it feels now like this will never change, but trust me, this will change. There was a time when it felt like Yahoo groups would own all discourse online, uh, and now nobody even knows what they are. Uh, GeoCities, there was a time when most of all websites were GeoCities websites, uh, and people have never heard of GeoCities today. 
Um, so I'm not so concerned that any of these companies can capture all of the internet. Also, too, uh, as time goes by and as we produce more and more data and more personal data, there becomes an increasing need to be able to manage this for ourselves. Now, we can't really manage this for ourselves yet, so we use photo services, we use social networks and all of that. But eventually, it will be as easy to manage our own data as it is to manage our own books. Uh, you know, we could always get books from the library, but most people have books at home because it's easier and it's more convenient. And that will be true of our data as well. And already, we're buying appliances like televisions, especially televisions. The new Samsung televisions are all networked. Um, and, and other appliances, stereo systems, toasters, all of these appliances are connected to your home network. And over time, your home network is going to, it, this will happen, it's going to develop the storage capacity. I, I already have like network hard drives in my living room. Once we have that, once we have easy tools, we will more and more move off of these common services and on to these uh, home networks, simply because it will be a lot cheaper. If you have, like, I, I have 25,000 photos. Uh, 25,000 photos is, I don't know, gigabytes. It's not quite 100 gigabytes, but it's, it's a bit less than 100 gigabytes. Uh, Keeping that online would cost me about $25, $30 a year. Uh, if I multiply that by 10 times, which is entirely possible because I'm just now beginning to shoot in raw format, which is much larger, uh, I could be looking at $250 a year just to store my photos. That suddenly becomes impractical. It becomes much more practical to store them at home and offer them on the internet from my home server. So I think we're going to see more of that sort of thing, where some of our data will be at home, some of our data will be online, uh, you know, some video will be at home, some will be online, and our home internet and the online internet will become harder, you know, much more indistinguishable. The more our home internet is part of our life, the less a company like Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of them can monopolize our online presence because we always have the opportunity to, to move, to, to move our data from wherever it is to our home environment. So I'm not too worried about it. Uh, you know, you, you need to become less and less of an expert today in order to do a lot of this stuff. I do it because I can, um, and it does take quite a bit of technical skill to do that, but people will build tools, people better than me, uh, will build tools to make this easily accessible. Uh, you know, it's, I like to compare, I like to compare internet technology with the internal combustion engine, or engines in general, and, you know, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, an engine was a highly technical thing that only experts could really use. Uh, you know, people who had cars really needed to be mechanics in order to use them because they would break down so often. You have, you know, their, their car would crash, right? Not crash into a telephone pole, but like just stop working. And you'd have to go in and, you know, and, yeah, and you know, there was the whole culture around it, right? You know, it's the you know the, the the greasers of the fifties and all of that. You know, they knew their engines. They go in, they they could air out their carburetor and all of that. And and that's the sort of thing with the internet today, where you know you have internet greasers uh, like me. I'm an internet greaser. There's a term for you. Uh, you know, but forward fifty years and you know, you, you don't even notice that you're buying an engine anymore. You, you get an automatic toothbrush, right? That's an engine. 
attached to a toothbrush, right? You don't even think of it. You just go to the drugstore and buy a toothbrush uh, or a fan or, or a car or a motorcycle or all of the other things that we put engines into, refrigerator, etc. It'll be like that, and it'll just be this whole array of devices, and we just buy them, we just use them, we don't even think about it, and more and more, they put control over our own data into our hands and less and less into the hands of internet greasers and the companies they form. I'm going to have to remember that term, internet greaser. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions? Let, let me ask all of you, what do you think about what I've said today? Does it, does it make sense to you, or does it sound like I'm blowing hot air? And you can say either. It's okay. I've got to you. So it's very interesting and so, uh, very interesting uh, way to look at education as a whole, um, especially if you think of it as a tool for socialization and, um, as well as delivering content. Um, so I think some of the areas for interest for us as an organization are going to be how you know, we, how well we're doing with helping transmit both the social aspect of learning as well as producing high quality content. Um, I've, uh, prior to working here, had some experience working in higher education, and I know that um, you briefly kind of touched on this as a consumer of education um, model. That was a very high, uh, highly controversial phrase, especially for professors who are tenured or fighting for tenure and then, you know, wonder why um, these bratty little students are coming with them to them with, with every little question and they more proactive and then kind of having a that students feel like they're doing, that they're purchasing learning because they're purchasing access for jobs and also the economics um, students that kind of uh, Discordance, which I'm sure a lot of uh, most of the folks here uh, did raise you or have just graduated and you know, starting to look at the jobs market. Um, that, you know, the saying that, you know, education is about jobs, which, which I would agree with you on, um, but it's very hard to hear in the, the job market and saying, well, you know, I did just pay all this money. Yeah. Um, and going into that experience, this whole this was the way to get a job, and now we're coming into an economy where, you know, you, you really may have to kind of kill what you need as far as you know uh, the freelance economy. Sorry, that's a, that's also a higher ed trade. Um, professor, their budget, their income is based on the research they have here um, in the U.S. Um, so at being able to have access to not only the whole system, but uh, creativity and resourcefulness is also going to be important. Um, I think as a follow-up question to what, uh, what you said, I would ask you for more thoughts on how you think credentialing fits into all of this. Uh, you mentioned that the best way to assess a student is to be able to assess a whole person. And um, I'm thinking back to my higher ed days, and I, I could just see a whole bunch of my you know, academic colleagues like hopping up and down saying, wait, you're telling me I now I have to hold everything's hand and kind of holistically be able to, you know, stand, give my stamp to people. This is something that's very work intensive. Um, how would traditional colleges look at that? How should um, kind of the open ed industry look at that? Uh, how how would you do that? How would you implement some sort of recognition that would you know make sense and be standardized enough 
Um, even though education isn't about jobs, for, for them to be able to say, well, I was assessed in a useful way. This is my stamp of knowledge um, that makes me a capable person, and makes me a, a capable, I guess, a vehicle for knowledge and resources, etc. Well, let's look at the end point first. Because that, that's a, you know, if we know, or if we have a sense of where it's going, keeping in mind we can't just predict and everything will come out magically like that. But uh, let, let's imagine, okay, and, and we'll put ourselves into this employer job context. So I'm an employer, I, I have a company here in Canada, say, and I have a job opening, I post the job opening, which might mean as simple as I tweeted it, but uh, probably not. But even, even, even before I post it, knowledge of my job opening will filter up through the community. At any rate, uh, I'm going to get expressions of interest from various people, and, and I might want to do a little head hunting anyways myself. So, how am I going to manage this? I will have an application. Uh, you know, it might be a, you know, something similar to a Facebook app. Only, you know, it's in the future, so it won't be Facebook and it won't be called an app. But you know, we'll just localize it for now. And what this app would do is, uh, it would look at the qualifications of people who are already in my company. So it looks at my company's profile, all of my employees' profiles, especially the person in the position I'm trying to fill. And if it's a new position, it'll look at other people in my company, and it may look at other people in other companies and look at those positions. And that kind of creates, if you will, a competency profile. Again, very bad, very cumbersome terminology for something that's really actually, you know, very detailed, very fine grain. But there's this thing that's a competency profile. It'll then take that and look at people on the internet, uh, look at the work that they've done, that they've made available now. It's not going to be everything because people have privacy considerations. They, they'll only put the work out of the communications out into public that they want to be publicly available. So they put their best foot forward, and we all understand that. Uh, you know, just like on somebody's Facebook page, they, they don't put everything on their Facebook page, or at least they shouldn't. Uh, sometimes they do, but we understand that too. Uh, and, and that's all okay. It's, it's all part of a rich tapestry, as, as my wife says, right? And so this program looks at this, and what it does basically is it compares the competency profile with each person out there, and it does this matching kind of exercise. And it'll never fit 100%, never. But it'll be sort of partial mapping. And, and these kind of you know, network-based, connectionist-based programs are really good at what, what they call partial pattern matching. And so it'll basically identify a set of people who are most similar to the competency profile that I'm trying to fill. It'll rank them, uh, and then it'll present those names to me. And then out of that list of names, some of them may be people who have applied, uh, others may be people who want, but basically it cuts through the whole competency definition and recruitment process so that when I have a position I want to fill, basically I put in a short request on my computer and I get a list of names. It's almost like, you know, I, I want to watch a movie on Netflix and so I open up Netflix and it has a set of suggestions for me uh, based on you know, what's new, what I've seen before, what it was in my taste profile, and I look at those top things, and, uh, you know, and they're different every day, because every day is different. 
uh, and I looked at something else today that I didn't look at yesterday. So it's sort of like that, and then it's like you know, it's not a Netflix of employees, but it, but it's almost like that, and then it gives me the opportunity to you know call them, interact with them because we still want to at least talk to the people before we hire them. So that's the end point, and so the question is, how can colleges, how can students, how can professors? prepare for this. Uh, well, we're not preparing people to pass tests anymore, uh, clearly. And, and I think the more effort we spend trying to teach people to pass tests, the less we're preparing them for the future, and also the less we're preparing ourselves for the future as educators, because we're kind of missing the boat. Uh, we're, I, it's, it's a good question. I don't think there's a single answer. I mean, I'm doing what I think is necessary to prepare for this by imagining the future and then talking about it, and then I'm designing software applications that I think will fit this future, and I'm, you know, fabricating, or fabricating is the wrong word, but telling the story around this future. Every time I tell it, I imagine it a little bit differently, a little bit more detail and all of that. So there's that aspect of it. Uh, if I was a professor in a university right now, well, I'd be just a few years from retirement. I wouldn't really worry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I'd be, I'd really be focused on. Well, I, I wouldn't. No, let me think. You know, when I was teaching college and university level classes, I was really, really interested, not in the content of the course, but in making sure that my students were literate. Uh, and, and I mean literate in this wider sense. Able to communicate. Able to comprehend what they read. You know, I, I, I would teach logic and critical thinking. I would skip most of logic and critical thinking. If they could read a newspaper editorial and identify what was said, what the argument was, and what the reasons were, I considered that a success. And it didn't matter to me whether they could identify and name all of the logical fallacies. What mattered to me is they could comprehend this editorial and respond to it intelligently. And I, I think this kind of basic literacy is at the core of every discipline. Yeah, you know, I think geography. Geography has nothing to do with language, but there is a literacy of geography. It's the same kind of literacy. Uh, you know, and geographers study the land, and and they study the people, and and you know the the culture and the buildings and the artifacts. But they do the same kind of thing. They read these things they study. And what's not important is that they name all the countries and all the capitals and all the languages of the world, but that they're able to look at a city or a community and, and be able to say, this is whatever it is, is what this community is saying to me as a whole. This is what this community stands for. This is what this community means. That's at the core of geography. And I'd be more focused on that. And as an educator, I'm more focused on this core of education. Education is, well, it's about reading people, and it's about teaching people to read all of these different languages. You know, it means that as an educator, I need to become as literate as I possibly can. If I'm literate, I'll survive any of these changes. It's not going to be a big deal. If the university goes broke and I have to make my own way in the world, if I really understand the core of how to help people learn, I'll always find employment. And, and I think that's always going to be true. And even deeper, I think, people who have this core, and, and I don't just mean basic literacy, basic memory, etc. But this this deeper understanding of how to get at what the message is, how to get at what the reason is, these are people who can, if there are no jobs available, 
can create and make jobs for themselves. They have they, because they have the creative capacity to look at the environment around them, find out what the, you know, recognize. It, you know, it's a process of recognition. We recognize what the opportunities are, have the tools to address those opportunities and make a living for themselves. And and this, you know, especially as, as we move toward an economy where we have less and less equity, uh, uh, more and more money in the hands of the very wealthy, the, the traditional economy becomes less and less functional and people have to learn to function outside it. Uh, and, and, and these are the skills that you need. So I think, yeah, I mean, if I had to answer that, well, I just did uh, answer that question. I think, yeah, getting at the core, getting at these, these basic literacies in each of these disciplines would be where I'd want to focus. I don't know if that was a coherent answer, but that was the best I could do. Well, Mr. Downs, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciated that answer. If there aren't any more comments, um, we really appreciate your time. It was definitely an honor. Um, and I thank you again. Uh, we uh, won't take up any more of it. Um, but really wanted to, if everybody really wants to thank you for spending some time with us today. Well, th thank you so much, and I really appreciate all of you taking so much time out of your afternoon to, to talk with me. I appreciate that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.